I kind of want to start um, the, the way I generally like to learn when I learn about something is I also kind of want to know who's teaching it and kind of what they're about and their kind of history and their ties to it all. So generally when I start this talk, I usually like to start with a little bit about myself. Um, I was actually born right across the bay in San Francisco. I uh, grew up in the lower mission out there and I got moved up to Sacramento. Um, grew up Catholic, so a lot of this stuff, these elements kind of feel fairly familiar to me. It's also kind of what drew me to Philemon, a lot of those Catholic elements. Um, and after leaving the Catholic Church, kind of got into Wicca, so I did a Druid for about two years. Um, and around that point, I kind of was getting a little frustrated. I, um, everything seemed very European-based. I was trying to, at that point, trying to figure out my own place and my own culture, uh, being that I'm Mexican Salvadorian. Uh, my mom was also born in the city, uh, while my dad is from El Salvador himself. Um, and I wanted to see what was out there as far as magically for me. Um, around that time, I had heard of Santa Muerte uh, from a YouTube video about, uh, up in, about a uh, trans woman up in New York, who I'll mention in a little bit. Um, but I kind of decided she was too new. I wanted to see about working with like the actual uh, Aztec deities and those sorts of things. Um, but nothing was really calling to me, nothing felt right. Um, around that time, I also got invited to my first Gnostic Mass. Uh, so my relationship with Santa Marta and Thelema have kind of been growing together. Um, and after a little bit of just trying to work with the Aztec, Mayan, Pantheons, and all that, I kind of caved, gave into her, uh, bought my first uh, little statue, which I did not bring with me, but I still have. It'll be my forever favorite one. That's a little green one made in Mexico. Um, and from there, it just kind of has blossomed. Um, I kind of want to also start just a little bit of background on her, like the who, what, when, where, why kind of stuff. Um, like I said, Santa Muerte that translates to Saint Death or Most Holy Death. Um, she is a like in combination of Miteca Suaro, which is the Aztec goddess of death, and the Spanish female Grim Reaper La Barca. I'll kind of go a little bit into those two in just a moment. Um, her Magical system is a mixture of folk Catholicism, of um, Aztec and Mayan lore, um, and also a little bit of Santeria and the ADRs, the African Dysphoria religions, um, that I'll kind of get into just a little, in a tad bit as well. Um, also, before kind of going on, something I just do want to note, because I always love mentioning this, the Aztecs is not, that's not their name. Uh, Aztec means from Mazatlan. Um, they actually refer to themselves um, as the Mexica, that's M-E-X-I-K-A, or C-A, depending on the spelling. Um, it's where we get Mexico, His, you know, mm -hmm. with the Hispanization, you get Mexico. Um, if an individual person were to say, you know, like, I'm an American sort of thing, it would be like uh, Mexica, very, that sort of gluttery kind of sound. Um, and so I always like to kind of mention that. So if you hear me say the word Mexica, I mean Aztec. Um, so just a heads up on that one. She is the patron saint of a lot of people the Catholic Church isn't exactly very fond of. Um, <laughs> just, to, just to even like, touch the surface on that. Uh, she uh, specifically is very fond of her uh, women practitioners, uh, people who work at night. So you see a lot of the time uh, prostitutes and taxi cab drivers are uh, <laughs> a really big following of her. Um, People who are near death or work with death daily, so you have that uh, the near death is where you, a lot of times you get the um, gang affiliations, but it's also where you get a lot of police also actually follow her as well. Um, you get uh, people who live in rough neighborhoods, people who dealt with a lot of death in their life or are constantly fear of dying, um, and um, with that you also get um, what was the last one I was going to mention. Um, you also get a lot of the queer community as well. She's very, very fond of the queer community. Um, that was like one of her first big resurgences is within Mexico's uh, queer barrios. Um, and those are kind of like her main uh, people that she kind of looks out for. Um, and also, yeah, those who work with death. So like a lot of like the morticians and uh, field directors. That was the last one I was going to mention too. Um, so that's usually who she kind of uh, <coughs> appeals more to, but obviously she is kind of for everybody. Um, her... Uh, like I said, yeah, her traditions are Catholicism and all that. Um, a lot of her followers are Catholic, which I think is interesting to note. Um, people like myself aren't Catholic and still follow her. Um, I guess with the EGC, I guess we're kind of Catholic. Um, right? But 
Yeah, she's not Roman Catholic, mm-hmm. but yeah, they're definitely a lot of people are Roman Catholic. Um, I follow her, um, but outside of that, her origins they start going way, way back. Um, as far as her Aztec origins, like I mentioned, Mitekasual, which translates actually pretty directly to the Lady of the Dead. She was the queen of Mitiklan, which is the Aztec underworld for those who died a natural death. Um, the Mexica had various different ideas of what happened when you died. Um, those who died in battle, men who died in battle would go to uh, join the sun rising. And um, women who died during childbirth, something that the Mexica viewed as a battle in and of itself. Um, the women who died during childbirth would go to the sun setting. Um, and become uh, butterflies, and uh, to assist the setting sun. Um, something that's kind of interesting as far as Dia de Muertos and the way it uh, lines up right now. There's a bunch of monarchs that go right through Oaxaca every yeah. Dia de Muertos, coming down from Canada. Uh, it's been happening for, for a long, long time. It's actually pretty rad. Um, she ruled it with her husband, who was the Lord of the Dead, um, his name, I've heard many different translations to. Um, I'm going to chop it up, though. It's Mitiklan uh, Sewutli. Um, is how you pronounce that, I believe. Um, them two kind of ruled together, a husband and wife duo. It was after traveling through the nine levels of Mitiklan, you would be at their feet and have to prove yourself to them to be able to um, pass through. Uh, the codices of the uh, Mexica kind of end there as far as the death story is concerned, the underworld. Um, the codices were tampered heavily by the Spanish conquistadores. Um, and it just, it seems like there should be more, but that's pretty much the last bit that we have, is that once you pass through these nine levels of utter torture, mountains slashing together, they have to try to pass through it, lakes of blood filled with jaguars, uh, you reach these two and then nothing. Um, <laughs> Some theories, one of my personal uh, favorites is that pretty much, or one of my, the ones I kind of believe honestly in the most, is that more or less the Spanish just messed with the codices. There's, uh, there's only one that definitely predates Spanish con- uh, conquest, and the rest of them you can definitely tell there was somebody looking over the shoulder. Um, historians have been able to prove that. Yeah. Similar things they did in, uh, that the Catholic Church did in Europe to the pagans out there. Uh, they pretty much did in the Americas as well. Um, Mitzika Sawado was believed to uh, have been born and sacrificed as an infant. Uh, this is a uh, folklore you hear, but you, historically, this duo was did not originate with the Mexica. It comes from older. Some folks say it was the uh, Olmecs or the Toltec people that kind of started with these deities, but kind of similar to the Rome, uh, Romans and the Greeks. The people of uh, Central America and Latin America pretty much kind of just carried on their deities in some way or another. Um, and Mitzika Sawadl is actually, it was her celebration where the modern Dia de Muertos celebration comes from. Uh, it was about a month-long celebration in the month of uh, in our Gregorian calendar, August. Um, and the I guess, yeah, the main one was two, was one month. But there was a previous one, too, right before, month, about a month before. That was kind of, it, it was a bit of a, let's just call it a lesser feast sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so the main one was the one in August, and it was for Mitik Sawadl. It honored uh, the adults in, who had passed, um, and when the Spanish conquerors came over, they just shifted it to line up with All Saints and All Souls Day, which is kind of funny because it ends up just an ancestor remembering holiday now lined up with Samhain, which is again an ancestor remembering holiday. So they just kind of ended up making, you know, uniting the two pagan worlds in my point of view. I think that's kind of funny. Um, and then aspects of her imagery that are still holdovers from her Mexica origins. Um, the owl is one of her main symbols. Mixteca Sawado, that was her animal form. All the uh, deities of the Mexica had animal forms. Uh, the owl was Mixteca Sawado, and an owl is what you still see often associated with her. In my altar at home, I have the little owl that I have perched actually on my Philemic altar right behind the Book of the Law. Um, just to kind of, for me to signify those that interconnectedness there. Um, you also see the fact that when she's holding a globe, uh, because it was Mitzika Swaddle said that uh, she was made of bone and her jaw was unhinged to swallow the stars in the world and the universe. Oh. Um, and so that kind of holding over as well. Um, as far as like her offerings as well too, 
Bopal, which again is a native um, wood, is also one of her big offerings. Um, and then a lot of this also ties into brujería and curandismo, which are two different types of practice of uh, magic within Latin America. Um, without going into too much, a lot of people consider brujería black magic and curandismo white magic. Um, they both have their merits and both have their usages. My great grandfather was a was a curandero, and so uh, uh, I've learned a little bit through the family lineage from him on that, uh, just from his memory on that line. Um, the skull definitely comes down from the Mexica origins. It was um, prior, again, to conquest. We, uh, Italian monks are the ones who brought making sugar skulls, like the sugar, how do you make them? Before that, we did it with amaranth grain and agave nectar to hold everything together. And it was during that month-long celebration that they would make little skulls out of it. And that was, again, the symbol for Mita Casuado. Um, and also the fact that she's uh, feminine, female, if you wish. Um, that's not, uh, death being feminine is not very prominent in um, a lot of cultures, um, but in Latin America it's kind of really taken hold, specifically in Mexico. Um, muerte, la muerte is feminine, um, and just in the Spanish language in and of itself as well, although the Spain, Spain did have their uh, Grim Reaper um, of Europe during the, like the uh, uh, Dark Ages and all that, which is where it brings us to La Barca. La Barca is her Spanish origin. Um, La Barca was the Grim, in Spanish lore, the, uh, the Grim Reaper's wife. She was said to be kinder, nicer, that you could, um, where the Grim Reaper would just come and take you away, La Barca would approach you kindly and let you know, tap on the shoulder, it's your time. And if you didn't want to go just yet, you could be like, hey, La Barca, like, I want to say bye real quick. Can we make a deal? Like, I'll say bye, and I promise I will meet you here at this time, that sort of thing. Um, and that, and she would usually agree. Um, she would, like, kind of let you, I guess, for lack of a better term, get your affairs in order, sort of thing. <laughs> um, and then uh, from her is where we get Santa Muerte's robe. It's also where you get her scythe. Um, and where you also see her scales. I don't believe any of the ones here have scales. Um, but yeah, the scales are often because she's, uh, she's death. Death takes everybody. Death is unjudgmental. So it's kind of that balance, uh, right there, whether you're good or bad, you're, you still gotta go. Um, but her cult, while a lot of people say it is a modern development within the 2000s and, uh, to now, uh, there's records going back that this has been around forever. Um, uh, uh, during colonial times and everything, uh, there's some Spanish records of women um, in Mestiza, which means, uh, or Mestiza, which is somebody who's part indigenous, part Spanish. Uh, the Spanish had a whole caste system, if you know, you guys. It's, it's not only how they categorized everybody, but there was these Mestiza women who were praying to a figure they called Santa Muerte, cloaked in red to bring back wandering husbands. Mm -hmm. And that is the first record we have of her. So a lot of people actually say her red robe is the OG robe. That's like her start. Um, there's also other records. Uh, just po She pops up in and out during colonial times. Um, but she kind of went through a little bit of a transformation between Mitzaka Sawadol and Santa Muerte uh, that we know today. Um, the main one, um, that a lot of people cite is La Catrina, La Calavera Catrina. Uh, you know, the skeleton woman with the big old hat, you know, that you see all around San Diego de los Muertos. Um, Jose Guadalupe Posada depicted her originally um, just from the shoulders up. That was meant to be a political cartoon, uh, kind of indicating, you know, that these, because uh, at the time Mexico was really trying to Europeanize um, imports. Um, get people from Europe to come in and actually whiten their population because that caste system was still, even though they had their liberation from Spain, was still heavily in place. Um, they, uh, uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada pretty much was like, you know, you can wear these, uh, specifically French, the French hats and French frills, but your bones, your core, you're still indigena, you're still indigenous. Um, and that's kind of what that signified. Um, what it ended up catching on to was pretty much becoming part of like the folk identity of Mexico being the blending of two cultures. There's a story in Mexico that, that is usually 
for lack of a better term, almost propaganda. Um, but the story is that there was two great cultures, of Sp the Spanish and then the Mexica, and they came together to create the almighty Mexican race. Um, but, you know, and so that's, that's kind of where that kind of comes from. It's the blending of the two cultures. Um, and a lot of people see uh, Mitteca Suwato kind of evolving into that because uh, Bosada did say that he pulled his, a lot of his inspiration for that, why, why she's female, why she's a skeleton, was Mitteca Suwato. And again, that was the death deity that the Mexica kind of went with. Um, and, but it was Diego Rivera, the famous painter, Frida Kahlo's husband, um, the one who gave her her full body figure um, in the painting, uh, Sueño de un Tarde Domisal in, Al uh, in Alameda Central, which is pretty much Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Central, um, which is, Alameda Central is right in Mexico City. Um, it was painted between 1946 and 1947, which covers the wall on the museum dedicated to him down in, in uh, the Ciudad de Mexico. And uh, it depicts Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, a bunch of other influential people, but front and center is La Caterina, but this time with a full garb, and they're marching down um, during a Dia de Muertos parade of sorts, um, and that it just took like wildfire from there. Um, and after that, again, there was some instances like there have been some people say you hear something popping up in the 40s. Um, one article said something about them, uh, you hearing her name pop up again in the 60s. Um, but it's really 2001. We jump, uh, we jump to the new millennium and Dona Queta, um, which is uh, Enrique Tarra Romero. Dona Queta is like a very affectionate name. It's uh, Santa Maristas, those of us who follow Santa Marta, that's what we kind of call her. Um, on Halloween 2001, she brought out her big old life-size altar out of her home put it on the sidewalk at Tepito, probably one of the roughest, toughest neighborhoods in Mexico City. Um, and she brought up the shrine in public because her son was in jail and he was on trumped up charges pretty much, is what the story goes. And she, she asked La Santa Muerte, like, if you please help my son get out, you know, I'll, I'll put you in front and center, I'll give you, you know, attention. And, bring people to you, um, and she did that. And without even realizing it, that's when the movement really got its rolling. Um, people came by droves to see this life-size uh, altar to her, and now every year she hosts a, um, a, big, old, uh, a big old posada, a big old party on, uh, on Halloween that, that ends with Dia de Muertos on the second uh, for La Santa Muerte. Um, Outside of that, she holds monthly services uh, where you're like she'll like there's there's blessings of people's statues and altars and paraphernalia of sorts. Um, there's there have been photos and documentaries about people, um, and again, this is folk Catholicism general too. This isn't necessarily just Santa Muerte, but I think this definitely goes to show how dedicated people are. It's something you'll see a lot. Um, there are men and women, people, that will just get down on their knees about a mile out in the street, mm -hmm. carrying their statue, and just shifting all the way about a mile out, just carrying their statues. Um, vendors have popped up selling goods and wares and uh, rosaries for Santa Muerte and uh, all sorts of everything you would need, you can pretty much find uh, right, around her, uh, right around her altar, um, and they'll do a rosary <coughs> for her. And granted, again, Dona Queta's Catholic. So it is, you know, uh, a traditional Roman Catholic rosary, but then Santa Muerte gets one of the mysteries too. Mm -hmm. And she kind of throws her right in there as well. Um, and that has been, yeah, that has been going on since 2001. Um, sadly, Dona Queta passed away about a year or so ago. Uh, it was a big loss to the community. She was, she was the one who kind of launched the modern movement. Um, but... Her shrine still holds true, and people still go every year, and they still hold a monthly rosary service for her. Um, and I think, honestly, she'll forever be remembered in the Santa Muerte circles as kind of launching it. Outside of her, though, there are a few others as well. The other Enriqueta, Enriqueta Vargas, uh, who is a self-stylized death evangelist. <laughs> she is every little bit the evangelist you kind of think about. She's got a tour bus and everything, <laughs> and, like, she... Um, 
she heads the Santa Muerte uh, International Temple. Um, it is a newer temple. She's also new to believe in Santa Muerte. She wasn't originally a follower of her. Her, um, her son was. Um, or, her own family, her son or family, I can't remember. Yeah, her son. Um, he's the one who originally founded the temple um, a couple years back. He actually created the largest Santa Muerte shrine in the world. It's 75 foot tall fiberglass, big old black Grim Reaper just kind of <laughs> hanging over uh, Mexico City um, <laughs> to prove his devotion to her. Um, and when he died, he was, as this, you see happen a lot in, um, you know, with, with uh, Santa Muerte and those who ask for her protection from the cartels and stuff, he was killed. Uh, 150 bullets right into his his truck, wow. uh, and when that happened, she just lost it, and she decided she wanted to find out who did this, get back at them, and then and wanted something with this help with it. Um, and I don't know the end of that story. All I know is she's taken over the church for it, um, drives around, and is. Uh, one of the other big shakers and movers in the Santa Muerte movement down in, down in uh, Mexico City. Um, the other one, uh, still in Mexico, is David Romero Grillan. Uh, he, he actually, funny enough, he started the uh, Iglesia Católica uh, Tradicional Mexicana Estadounidense, which is uh, the Mexican U.S. Catholic Apocalyptic eh, Traditional Church. Um, wow. It's a mouthful. He actually got a church dedicated to Santa Muerte recognized by the Mexican government for about three years eh? uh, okay. before they rescinded and took it back. Mm -hmm. um, and that, but that kind of showed to uh, <coughs> Santa Muerte's followers that like you can be legitimized. It's just going to be a little more difficult. And I feel like as Thelemites, sometimes we might understand that. Um, mm -hmm. He um, in two thousand and nine. Uh, the U.S., uh, the Mexican government, because of the cartel association with Santa Marta that I'll get into in a little bit later, um, because of that, they went through and demolished about 30-plus public shrines of Santa Marta along the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, and because of this, David Romero uh, pretty much declared, in his words, a holy war against, uh, against the Mexican government because of that. Um, this was after they rescinded his um, church status as well. Um, and then after, a little after his declaration of this holy war, uh, he was arrested and was sentenced on criminal charges um, and pretty much cut ties to the cartel again. Uh, whether those charges are true or not, nobody really knows. Um, I mean, I wouldn't put it past it, but also at the same time with how public he was about his belief in Santa Muerte and how he kind of did also go after the Mexican government for desecrating the shrines, you never really know. Um, the last one I do want to mention is the one I mentioned earlier. Her name is, her name is um, Erlie Vasquez. She is based in Queens, New York. Uh, she is an immigrant trans woman who came up um, from uh, southern Mexico and was just running for her life at that point. She didn't have an ounce of hope but Santa, she asked Santa Muerte, please help me, guide me, get me to the north, get me somewhere I can be safe, I can be my true, honest self. And she made it. She made it all the way to New York safe and sound. And when she got herself established, when she got, you know, just the basic needs met, she promised Santa Muerte that she would throw her a big old ball, a big old party ball um, in her honor uh, on Ariel's birthday. It was when she decided to publicly come out as Ariel, this is the new her now. Um, and this has been going on uh, yearly since there's mariachis, there's bands, there's children, there's food. It's pretty much a giant quinceanera with the star being front and center, Santa Muerte, in the biggest, fluffiest dresses you've ever seen. Oh my God. <laughs> like, you can actually, it's, you can actually buy them to actually like wrap your little Santa Muerte statue on. It's actually kind of cool. You can dress her up, make her all fancy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so that was, uh, she's the main person here in the U.S. kind of um, uh, proclamating and uh, proselytizing Santa Muerte's um, powers and belief in her. Uh, it was one of her videos that I first found Santa Muerte myself. Um, 
one of these days I'll make it to Queens and be able to attend this party. It sounds pretty rad. <laughs> um, it's tequila and conchas everywhere in the land. Um, but yeah, those are pretty much like kind of the ones who are kind of getting the movement moving now um, and where it's going. Um, since then, though, again, most of the followers are Catholic. Um, majority of the followers are women and they're young, they're younger people. Um, and a lot of them are still in Southern Mexico, although the population of, uh, in the U.S., as far as her belief, believers, are starting to grow. It's one of the fastest growing uh, religions in the world. Um, David Romero in 2006, I think, was quoted as saying that her uh, followers counted for about 5% of Mexico's population. Um, so she's definitely gaining population, uh, popul you know, populace. Um, I think, again, because it works whether you're Catholic or not is one of the big, big reasons is for that as well. Um, and that's kind of just like, yeah, basic background for her and her history and where her, her cult is going right now. Um, kind of going, shifting gears a little bit to go into how her system works and, um, and those sort of things. Uh, the colors, you can see here I have a yellow, a gold, and a purple. Um, a lot of it is pretty basic color magic. Red is love, uh, black is protection, and vengeance. She's not afraid to get back at those who hurt you, which is, I think, a big component of something with this uh, cult. Uh, white is purity, but it's also a catch-all. If you don't have any other color, you just get a white one and it'll do whatever you need. Um, blue is knowledge. A lot of students will use this one. Um, I personally, I, I, it was algebra two. It was for my degree, it was the last class I needed. It was a test, I had, I had, a, I had a D in the class and I needed to be able to graduate. I took a little blue statue, and I studied, 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 studied. I took a little statue, though, a little blue one, about yay big, little pocket size. You know, you see the little Buddhas and all that? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the same concept. Um, stuck it in my pocket, went to class, put it on top of my desk, and I'm just like, help me, please. Mm -hmm. I passed that class with a B. I'm just mm -hmm. like, damn. Well yeah, well algebra two, man. I'm not, I'm not a math person. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely an English person myself, history. But uh, blue, yeah, definitely for knowledge. Purple is for magic. Um, when I was first getting to know her, um, I put a purple altar cloth, because I was like, again, the foundation for it. Um, specifically, yeah, magic and psychic abilities, that sort of thing. Uh, an interesting one to note, green is legal magic. She has a whole section for law and legal workings. Um, again, because a lot of her uh, her followers are victims of the cartels, are dealing in rough neighborhoods, or committing petty crimes just to get by, doing what they got to do. Um, the law plays a big role in her in her system. People pray for her. A lot of the time, people are praying for her to get a loved one out of jail quickly, to keep from getting um, taken by the police or the, the immigration. Um, the reason green works in this sort of way, because green, again, is natural. The whole idea is the natural way of things. If you are innocent, the courts should find you innocent. We all know that's not always exactly the case. Um, and so people work with the green one to hopefully assist the legal system to work in the way it should ideally work. Um, those who want to cheat the legal system will generally use the black one. Uh, black is also specifically associated with witchcraft. Um, it's something interesting to note, those of us those uh, the Muerta followers doing all this and lighting candles, incense, and prayers, and oils, and all this sort of stuff still don't like witchcraft. Mm. You know, um, brujería. I find that interesting. Um, gold is for money, um, and there's also the seven colored ones. I have uh, this candle right over here. Uh, it's kind of melted down since, but um, the seven colored ones come. Uh, seven colored candles come from the seven African powers in Santeria, um, and you can also find statues that have that seven color system as well. Um, that was one of my first ones. I actually was uh, outside of the little green one when I got my first nice one, um, was a seven colored one, her sitting on a throne. Um, that's also, for a lot of people, that's also a catch-all. And so a lot of people new to her magic will use that one as well, um, just because it's just, you can do anything and everything with it, whereas white, Yes, technically it's a catch-all, but it's a little more difficult for people to kind of you know, just get in that right brain space for it. Um, red, black, and white, though, are the traditional ones. 
there's some Santamaristas that refuse to acknowledge all the other colors and mm -hmm. say, nope, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. You have black for protection and bad magic, white for um, cleansing and good magic, and you have red for love magic. And somewhere so under all those, pretty much whatever you need is going to fall underneath there. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have other people who go the whole opposite way. Um, you'll have a deep red will be sexual love. Um, a pink will be romantic love, but like a like a more of a maroonish red would be more for self love, um, and so you have people splitting hairs all over the place with these. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's just a botanic trying to make a dime, which you know, <laughs> I more power to them because I want every one of every color. Now. <laughs> I really do. It's a it's a bad habit. Don't I uh, think about it, buying curly books can get expensive. <laughs> um, one of the other uh, other aspects of her uh, veneration are the tools that you use. Um, her incense, your traditional Roman Catholic, frankincense and myrrh. Um, also, again, like I mentioned earlier, copal, uh, specifically copal resin, it works the best for her. Uh, she also has her own um, incense, Santa Muerte incense, uh, as you see here. That is what I have burning currently. Um, these I have found in my personal workings with her to be her favorites. Uh, depending on the working I'm doing. If I'm just burning a general, I'm cleaning her altar and this is for you, she likes these ones. If I'm doing actual work, generally she'll like frankincense or cobal, um, depending on the working. Um, that's just, again, a personal preference. Um, you also have sprays. So, so, again, something that comes out of the Santeria traditions um, is aerosol cans. Yeah, it's a little think... So the origin of aerosol cans within Santaria, but also in Santa Muerte's tradition, is sympathetic magic. Like equals like. If a spell calls for rose and you ain't got rose because you're, a, you know, think right. times, yeah, where people of color were even worse kept down, you, you, get act, you don't have access to flowers, you don't have the money to get these sort of things, but you got, you clean in somebody's house and they have rose-scented air spray <laughs> or rose-scented <laughs> perfume, you can use that, and that'll work. Because again, like equals like. Um, what ended up happening, though, is what started out of a need for, uh, just a necessity, started becoming tradition. And so now you have ones like money drawing, ven dinero. You spray this, and it'll <coughs> draw money for whatever you do. Uh, when I first got this, uh, I mean, I was, uh, I, I, after cleaning my apron, because I'm a server, you know, tips, I clean my apron, clean my ba uh, clean out my, my server book, just give them both a nice little spray, you know? <laughs> help, help bring in some of those kids to pay the rent. Um, so you see aerosol cans. Um, again, kind of throwing back with, again, Santeria, hoodoo traditions as well. Florida water. This stuff is pretty much our holy water. Uh, this is the stuff right here. This brand particularly, this is the classic one. It originally started out as a unisex perfume. Uh, made by some guy in New York, and via the catalogs that were just easily accessible in the South and all that, it just started getting tied to uh, the ADRs and hoodoo as well. Um, going back to perfumes, um, this is a perfume for her. Um, different scented, different colored ones. Um, you guys can always, if you want to come up and smell it later on, you're more than welcome to. Um, whenever I do a working with her, I'll spray this on, or if I'm traveling, as, you know, like tonight, before I came here, just made a little, you know, keep me safe on the road sort of thing. Um, you also have bath salts, not those kind. Um, these ones you put in your bath, and you can do a working with her, um, as sort of a cleansing you can do. Um, I don't know how popular these are. They, I, I don't know a lot of practitioners who do work with them, because the interesting thing with these is you're meant to be using a bath, but one of the things with Santa Muerte is you're also not supposed to be naked in front of her. <laughs> so I'm particularly, you know, each practitioner has their own preferences. I'll go into, like, the rules with her altar in a little bit, too. Um, one of the other things you have here, kind of an incense thing, but this is specifically a house blessing cleaning one. Again, similar to the incense, but they're just, they, they come out with everything for these. But again, this traditionally goes back to Santeria, um, having house cleansers, oils. So when you, make, when you blend your own candles sort of thing, a lot of us might about all that stuff. Uh, powder, this thing, you add it to your spell, your candle is supposed to make your uh, 
your uh, spell extra uh, strong. One of the advice I was given by a bruja was uh, put a little in your shoes. And so with every step you take, you're protected by her. I thought that was interesting. Um, and then, of course, we got tarot cards. Um, there's a pretty popular one out there uh, that looks fairly similar to this. One over here. Uh, some, this is the Oracle one. Um, it's the Book of the Yeah, something about the Oracle, Book of the Dead. Uh, the guy's name is uh, Fabio Destrani. He's an Italian guy. Um, this one is good. Um, it's definitely more Dia de Muertos based, um, less Santa Muerte. Um, the one I particularly like myself is this one, the Tarot de la Santa Muerte. Mm. This one's all, mm, pardon me, all in Spanish. Um, and her, she's on almost every single card. One of the part, things I particularly like about it is um, her robe colors go with the cards. The fool is uh, the, on the fool card. She's in a blue robe. Again, knowledge, growth, that sort of thing. Uh, on the magician, she's in her purple robe. Um, and so I think when I was learning tarot, as I as I'm still learning tarot, it kind of really helped me because I'm more familiar with her system. Um, and so I think that's one of my particular reasons why I like it. And also, each suit is color coded. Is color coded as well. Um, I'm gonna pass these around. I'm just letting you guys know the artist. I swear. Read way too much heavy metal comic. <laughs> uh, the proportions on these people are inhuman. Um, but yeah. Um, and something I think also just interesting to note, but also notice for being all in Spanish and being a Latino system of magic, almost every person in here is fairly fair skinned and blonde and light brown hair. And again, that kind of alludes to the colorism um, and racism that's still pretty predominant in Latino culture due to colonization and what and all that. Um, and so I do hope one day there'll be a deck will come out that has the same spirit but also can acknowledge where the Latino community is going. Um, I guess now the Latinx community is going mm -hmm. um, with our understanding of race and color <coughs> and class and all sorts of things. Um, I'm gonna pass these around if you guys want to go ahead and take a look at them if you want. I think these are just kind of fascinating. Um, um, Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. And for more tools, let's see where, where I'm at. Um, you also have books, uh, prayer books for her. These, like, especially these little thin ones, are very, very popular for all the saints um, in folk Catholicism. There's, I have one for the Virgin Guadalupe. There's one for St. Jude. So Santa Muerte, of course, would have her own. Um, for somebody who's interested in working with Santa Muerte and her traditional system, this book particularly is one I highly recommend, uh, is The Magical Powers of the Holy Death. Um, it is an English translation of um, La Biblia de Santa Muerte, which is yeah, the Santa Muerte Bible. Um, it has things for a novena, which are uh, nine days uh, candle spell workings, prayers, um, her rosaries in here, prayers for whatever you need, um, and also just a little bit about her as well. Um, and these can mostly be good, again, at most botanic guys you can, that one I found online though, I, the English one was a little more difficult to come by. Because um, again, her majority of her following are Latinos, uh, or at least Spanish speaking. Um, and the way you kind of work with her though, is when you, once you grab your book, is kind of going back to La Parca, you make tratos, you make deals. Uh, you you pray to her to you know say your thanks, this and that, but when you need something, you don't just ask for it. You you have to give something in return. It's a give and take sort of system. Um, some of the like some of her uh, um, favorite offerings when you're doing these deals. She loves apples for some reason. Um, some scholars say that is a tie back through La Barca to the witchcraft of Europe. Um, she loves incense. She loves food. She also loves her vices. <clears throat> Marijuana is one of her sacred plants. She loves tobacco. She loves tequila. She loves beer. She loves mezcal, you know, comiteco, what have you. If you drink it, she wants it. Um, <laughs> she particularly loves anything you love. So somebody who's not sm who's not who's a not smoker isn't going to offer her cigarettes because think of it as like something with your best friend, you know? You don't um, you know, you don't go to anybody, "Hey, I I don't smoke, but here, have a pack of smokes." It's like you want to give them something that means something to you. And so yeah. that's kind of what you do here, too. Um, 
a lot of the times, like when I'm making food, I will cut out a portion and put it on a plate for her. Um, she really loves fresh, fresh food like that. Uh, she loves chocolate, because again, chocolate is uh, indigenous to the Americas. Um, and then one of the other big ones you see is tattoos. Tattoos are a very, very popular offering for her. And because it kind of displays that affection, that love for her. Uh, the one, um, when I asked her to help me out with that test, this was a tattoo I got for her. Um, I, because my, I got family in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, which is on a border town, it is also really popping with medical work, um, traffic. Um, I knew if I got a tattoo for her, because the Mexican government will, if they, when they see tattoos or something, they kind of put an automatic association of, of gang affiliation or cartel affiliation. Um, and so having open tattoos for her is A, when you, when, when you are in Mexico is, I mean, that, that's shown some dedication, but it can also um, be a little on the dangerous side. So mm -hmm. to kind of cover my tracks because that's where my family's from and my Spanish isn't the best because I, was grow I, I grew up here and my first language was English, um, I wanted it kind of coded. Um, it's a pretty much a Santa Muerte sigil um, that I kind of made for her, um, kind of based some of it off of uh, Frati uh, Udi's uh, Sigil Magic book, which is one of my personal mm -hmm. favorites. Um, and that's like, that, that's one of the big, big important things for her as far as offerings. Um, a little bit on the altar though, when you are doing your work and kind of like uh, how to and just general workings for her. Um, one of the big things is you want your altar cloth no more than about an inch down. I don't particularly know the history of this, but everybody I've talked to, uh, all my teachers in this system, it's an inch down. Um, you generally want the cloth to be a color of something you're you're specifically working for or doing, um, or an end goal of sorts. Uh, she always has water. Um, when you have lots of statues, generally a few big cups of water will work. If you just have a few, um, like one or two, she specifically likes individual water for each statue. Um, she wants her incense, she wants her offerings, um, you don't, like I mentioned earlier, you don't get naked in front of her. I think this again goes back to the Catholic aspects of her. She's a saint to a lot of uh, her followers. Um, you don't get naked in front of uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe. You don't do um, sexual things in that sort of way. And so for some people, that is a big thing. Um, and so with that, a lot of the times her altar is sometimes a little difficult where to place it because in the bedroom, it's a little difficult to do. So what some people do will actually something similar to here is a lot of people like um, will have a closet put away and just run something over and make like a you know um, a curtain so she can just unveil it whenever you need to and then close it up when you're not working with her. Um, she personally um, from what I've heard and what I've done myself, she likes being in the front room. She likes mm -hmm. being by the door. Uh, she likes being the first thing people see when they come into your home. Right. Uh, she is a diva, this one. I love it. Mm -hmm. She is all about it. She wants all that attention. Um, as far as, like, um, the yeah, rest of the altar setup, it's kind of whatever works for you. Um, some people will have, the, uh, like, all the different colors put away and only have the one they're working on on the altar. People like myself, I have my uh, main altar with all of them on there. Um, one big thing though is she does not like other deities um, or saints on her altar. It's a no-go for her. She has two exceptions. Virgen de Guadalupe, because a lot of people consider them sisters. Virgen is life, Santa Muerte is death. And, um, and Saint Jude. Um, again, I think this has more to do with these are the top three saints in Mexico. Um, but even with that, they're not on the same tier. Like, kind of how I have set up here, if I had a Virgen de Guadalupe statue, it would be here, Santa Marta would be here. If you put them side by side, she ain't gonna be happy. Um, again, she likes her own space. She's, uh, she has a bubble. You gotta respect that. Um, so that's something a lot of people, uh, especially magical folk, kind of sometimes have problems, or have trouble doing, because there's only so much space you can have. And so figure out how to do that. Uh, so like what I have in my home set up, is I have a table, a low table, and I have a uh, uh, pretty much what looks like for like to put like shoes in, you know, a little shelf. Mm -hmm. um, I've, uh, I have her on that top one, and then I have the Vedican on one side, 
and then this other uh, Mayan originated folk saying called Mashimon or San Simon um, on the other side. Um, and she's okay that one for me, just because I also have Salvadorian, so she's like, here, your other half too. Um, so those are some like big, like just kind of pointers on how you're setting it up. Um, you always want to make sure you're changing the water every day, food every day, that sort of thing. Directionality of the altar? Don't matter really. Again, so long as it's, you're not, as long as it's easy to not be naked or doing other things in front of real that nature. Um, so, so chant no particular attachment to being in the west because death or the east. No, the not really. Um, the one thing I mostly hear is, again, she likes facing doorways. She likes being towards the entrance. That's like, that's mostly what you hear. Like what? Uh, doorways. She likes Door. being in towards the entrance. Um, but other than that, there's not really any sort of like specific placement for her. Um, bam. Um, and while, so say you've decided you kind of want to work with her, um, there's a couple different ways in which she works with people. Um, I've kind of, myself, the way I've, when I've been doing this lecture, I've kind of broken it down into two groups, two groups of three, and, and, those, and they kind of intermingle. Uh, one is the different types of relationship, uh, relationships she works with people. Uh, there's folks like myself who, she is my life, she'll always have an altar for me, she, I, she's tattooed on my skin, I wear her rosary everywhere I go. Um, well, fun fact about me and the Gnostic Mass, whenever we're doing the Eucharist, uh, I do my little cross, I specifically say, uh, and then I take the Eucharist. It's, she's an intrinsical part of my life and all of my magic. Um, then there's another portion, uh, there's another type of group of people where it's more one-off one, one workings. You know, either she decides she needs your help, or you decide she need, you, uh, you need her help, one or the other. Sometimes she'll come to you um, when you don't even are at least expecting it. Um, and that's generally just a, she'll show you like, hey, I need something done, and you're the one to do it. So, <laughs> like, get this thing, do this thing, light this candle. All right, you're done, deuces. Like, she's good. Like, there's, you know, and, and it's simple. You don't need to do more for that. Um, then the other type of... Um, relationship with her is more the like a, a I got you kind of thing. Uh, one of the owners of the Botanica out in, out in Sacramento that I go to, I frequent a lot, I'm um, actually writing up this gold one. Uh, he asked me one day when I came in um, and he said that they just moved into a new house. Um, they were getting everything out of the garage and he heard something fall. And when he went to the back of the garage behind all the stuff, nothing had fallen. There was nothing there. Mm -hmm. But stained on the ground, it would almost look like oil stain kind of thing, was an outline very similar to Santa Muerte, mm -hmm. uh, to, to her figure. And he owns a botanica. He doesn't work with her. Um, he's a Santero. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, uh, he doesn't work with her, doesn't know much about her. He sells her stuff because it sells, and, um, and some Santeros work with her, too. Um, and, but he doesn't really know her that well. And he's like, well, what does it mean, this and that? Um, and I asked him, like, you know, well, you know, have you communicated with her recently? Have you lit a candle for her? You know, and he said, I haven't. I was like, well, I, I, my advice, grab one of these candles you got here. Um, specifically like a, a white one just like a new beginning fresh like what do you want kind of feel putting out your feelers sort of thing um, and he came back when, uh, he gave me a, he, uh, I gave him my number he shot me a text about a week later and he pretty much told me it's like she doesn't want me to work with her she doesn't want me to light up a candle or put any altars really anymore she just wants to know wants me to know that I got your back mm -hmm. that whatever you do you know I may not actively be there for you like there but like, if something goes wrong, I got you, don't worry, you know? Mm. And for a lot of people, that's something, that's a, that's a really, uh, one of the main ways she works with a lot of folks, um, especially those who are involved in all sorts of other different traditions, mm. is she's kind of singled you out for some reason or another, and she's just like, mm. I've crossed your path for a reason, I'm not necessarily your bread and butter, but like, just, just know that I got you. And what some people do have this type of relationship with her, is they will 
have a white statue or a little black one or a seven color, just like one of the basic ones. I'll have a little, uh, a little mini altar. Uh, they'll put a little cloth down, because uh, one thing I didn't mention, you always want uh, something down. You never want to just set it on the plain table. I feel like that's kind of magic one one now. Um, and um, they'll just have her in the corner, just somewhere off to the side, you know, just like, I got you. Like, you know, you're there with your little shot glass of water, you're cool. Like, um, and that's a, that's a, I think that says something about her um, and who she is and how universal death really is and how she'll, even if she doesn't want you doing all that, she'll still take care of you. And I think that's, that's uh, it, to me, kind of beautiful in its own way. Um, again, a lot of people that she'll cling to or work with are Latinos. Um, there been, there's been a rise in her following amongst uh, Latino millennials since uh, the election. You can also wonder why um, a lot of DACA students, um, dreamers, and those sorts of folks. Um, and then again, uh, women, queer folks, people of color, um, they've all, you know, she, she'll, she'll just come to me like, you know what, like, you're my people, I got you, you know? Um, and not, uh, not expect a lot in return. You don't need to necessarily make a deal with her to, to kind of have her blessing. Uh, one, of the relation, one of the ways you see her is very much like, uh, uh, um, that I'll get into a moment, is, is very much the patrona, the, the, the uh, godmother kind of figure, mm -hmm. godmother kind of role. And that kind of, like I mentioned, just leads into, within those three ways of working with her, the relationship you have with her can be a little different. Uh, there's some that, yes, that's the patrona. She's the, that godmother that I'll take care of you, you know. Um, I may not always be there, but when shit gets tough, I got you. Um, but then there's also um, those people who feel more of a maternal vibe from her, uh, which is understandable. Um, there are some tons of much statues you can purchase that actually have her pregnant, um, uh, which I find interesting. There's so, there's... Um, and that kind of alludes to that. Um, and one of the other ones that is probably one of the more interesting ones, um, I think the uh, Thelemites would also very much understand. There's very much definitely a sort of love, almost sexual energy kind of like uh, way to kind of connect with that. It's that sort of like, uh, there's some folks who kind of see her as like, that's like that's like my, uh, uh, mi vieja, which is like a, a in Spanish, it's uh, it's my old woman. It's uh, you know that's uh, that's my that's my wife in death. That's my lover. That's you know, you know I I she, I've got her back. She's got me, and that's another way a lot of people kind of view her the relationship with her, um, and those, the patrona, the motherly, uh, the romantic, uh, all kind of. Those can work in different ways at different times within the three different ways you could work with her being a more casual, uh, a one time off or. Um, you know, your, or like dedicated life service sort of thing. Um, and because of that, there's so many different ways to work with her, so many different people that are drawn to her. Um, and with all of that, um, one of the big things that a lot of people are talking about right now is her system is changing because of that influence. Um, there is a book out there that I am not that big of a fan of um, that says you can cast, uh, work with her in a Wiccan sort of way. Cast a circle, banish her at the end, uh, license apart type of thing. Um, when you're saying your prayer, say so mode it be. Uh, you, there, she recommends using the runes to work with her. Uh, there was a guy out in New Orleans out of Santa Muerte Church that, funny enough, doesn't exist anymore. Um, he said that Santa Muerte is because she's it's in Spanish, she is more Spanish, which means she's more European, which means she's more white, and her, his whole thing, his whole mission was to take her back from the Latinos that stole her, the like even brown people. Um, and oh yeah, and so, and sadly, the one that I meant, not this guy, but the one I mentioned with the Ruins of the Wicked Way, that book was recently published by Llewellyn, and is like one of the first top ones you see in the Google search, um, and it's kind of sad that that's what a lot of people are like starting to see for her. And so one of the things within the community we're talking about, how can we, you know, show that Santa Muerte is open to anybody and everybody. It don't have to be a queer Latino to work with her, but also kind of respect her roots and her cultures where she came from. There's a lot of, you know, the African slaves, the indigenous 
the pea population was wiped out, the mestizo, all of those people, her system is built on off of them and their belief and their love mm -hmm. and, and their work. And we need to be able to be able to respect that too when we work with her. Um, and so with that, I say if you're interested in her and you want to buy your, or like get a statue or a candle, go to your local botanica, go to the mission, go to, you know, uh, support, you know, local and brown businesses um, and um, women entrepreneurs who are making like, uh, there's this uh, one Chicana um, who's making her own rosaries for Santa Muerte Alpha Etsy, you know, you can uh, support her, support those sorts of things. And, you know, pay that respect towards the history, towards the culture um, and her origin in that sort of way. Because Santa Muerte, she's a, a beautiful, beautiful deity, a saint, however you want to see her. And she'll help you, but you also got to respect her and her people too. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, yeah, not really a question, but more of a, there's a, there is a Botanica on 24th Street in San Francisco mm -hmm. that is specifically dedicated to her. Yeah. I don't and know the city too well. Um, alive. Is that the one with the big old red uh, in the window? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And you go inside and there's an enormous altar. Mm -hmm. right? In the back? Really alive. Oh, yeah. 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 I, uh, there's, isn't that like, there's an apothecary right around the corner, right? Is yeah, that the one I'm thinking? Uh, yeah. No, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, uh, if it's the same one I, I'm remembering, I found myself there randomly. I'm like, okay, thank you for leading me here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cool. That's, that's where I got the statue that I have. That's awesome. Um, I walked in and, and it's like, wow. And kind of, was, I was looking at the behind the counter, the, all the stuff there, and I there's this voice saying, don't worry, your, your job is coming. I just lost my job. And it's like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's that I got you. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. That's awesome. There seems to be rather a lot of correspondence and sympathetic magic in mm -hmm. this system. So I'm curious uh, how much, if any of that, applies with the rosaries. Like, are there particular uh, types of beads or wood or mm -hmm. colors that are more associated with this or that or she doesn't like you know, some um, kind of gem? Or yeah. Um, so I've seen the I didn't, I didn't know the words. Um, <laughs> I've seen it with so many different rosaries. The ones you can buy in the store, the most ones you see are these generally fabric <clears throat> or plastic. They're pretty traditional. Um, but the ones I've seen custom, like one I would love to be able to do myself um, one day, is using like just indigenous type of, uh, like indigenous to the Americas, Latin America, uh, stones, obsidian, uh, copal wood, and those sorts of things. Um, I've seen one that had both of those, like the the, the big beads were obsidian, uh, <laughs> and then the small ones were were the cobalt wood, and then uh, um, and the trumpet was just the was just the metal, um, or whatever pewter. Um, but yeah, there, as far as like her rosary is concerned, um, it's it's just kind of your typical rosaries, however people want to make them. Um, some people, I've seen ones that are super expensive, they don't like them out of gold, because again, they're you know using them for money magic and those sorts of things, different colors. Um, but usually, yeah, it's a lot of the plastic beads you'll find. It's just your, like your typical $10 rosary yeah, at, a, yeah. at a Catholic store. Oh. That's a question of you. Uh, as I was noting your recommendation of the book, mm. um, I did notice there's a book published by Weiser by Rollins? Oh, yes. Then I, okay, I was incorrect. The one published by Llewellyn is by Tomas uh, Power, Brawler. And that one I do like. It's, yes, the wiser is Rollins is the one that, that I'm not one. too fond of. Yeah. Okay. The one published by Llewellyn, um, <laughs> Thomas Prowler, uh, he has, uh, it's a really good book, that one, um, but it's, its audience is definitely your mundane Roman Catholic who's just figuring out what sympathetic magic is. Mm -hmm. um, and he's who well, half the book is Magic 101. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's it, it's it's Wicca 101 for half the, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of like uh, 
candles and prayers and energy. What is energy transference and those sorts of things? Um, yeah, the ones by Rollins is the one that I'm particularly not too fond of. The one gem in that, though, if you find it, I'm waiting for the day it makes it online. You don't need to read the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. It's her rosary. She does a rosary specifically for Santa Muerte. It takes out all the Roman Catholic elements to, of it um, and keeps the Santa Muerte, uh, it focus, it hyper-focuses it. That is really good. I personally use that one. Um, other than that, it's just... Uh, if you're going to do any book as far as more history too, uh, Devoted to Death by Andrew Chestnut. Yes. Uh, that is, he's the first scholar to write a book on her uh, in English. There's a lot, there's some other good books in Spanish. Um, but again, you know, um, as far as the English speaking world, he's was a really good one. He's a, um, he's a, uh, I believe he's a priest, um, teacher, and he's a, he's a professor. And he uh, went down to Mexico City, he met Dona Queta, interviewed her. Um, and the one, I guess it's a thing I like and thing I don't like is he, the whole book, he's very, very neutral and fair. And towards the end, he gets almost a little sympathetic by saying, well, this is obviously why people work with her. Mm -hmm. A couple years later, for his, for a big old Christian newspaper, he released an article damning her as demonic. Um, <laughs> and so I don't, yeah. So it's like, okay, if those were your biases, at least you kept that out of your historical account book. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah as far as basic history, that. though, it's a good one. Hmm? He, he may have been told he had to do that. From oh, yeah, totally, probably. Because uh, he says even in his book, which was obviously published before this article, that uh, he has a little statue of her on his on his desk now. <laughs> and he wrote that in the introduction. So I'm just like, I, I feel like so somebody was telling me, like, hey, you, know, <laughs> you need to retract that statement. Um, yeah. Any question? Uh, what are your thoughts on the Santa Muerte if it is made 3D printed? 3D printed? <laughs> that, I think, would be kind of epic. I just also <laughs> never seen a 3D printer work in, you know, in real life. Um, but again, um, so Santa Muerte statues, um, a lot of the time now they're being, uh, by big distributors, are being made in China. Even though you find the botanicals are made in China. Funny enough, um, so, uh, the ones that are, are made in Mexico, um, this doesn't have a best one the bottom. Um, but you kind of see the bottom, it's got like different seeds and things, uh, yeah. um, they're charged. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them will have vessels on them, this one particularly has them in the front, so it doesn't have them in the bottom. Um, the ones made in China will have a Chinese lucky coin in the bottom. <laughs> so with how international the Latino culture, as far as the people, it's, I mean, talk about U.S. being a melting pot, not Latin America, man, that is the melting pot. Um, there's a there's a little bit of everybody down there. Um, I, so I, as far as that, and like how it all kind of came together in Latin America, uh, I think the Chinese kind of money coin is just kind of an interesting little like you know nod to that. Um, so with making one, um, the big deal would be to properly charging it, um, and of course you can always I would assume you'd be able to leave like a hole in the bottom that you could then fill yourself with resin and wax and stuff. Um, but that would be the main issue, I think. Oh, really, would be I that. I didn't know that there was uh, things underneath them. Yeah, right. not all of them. Like, this is, these are one of the, one of the, uh, it's the Victoria Collection. These are one of the ones made in China, and this one's got nothing. But I soaked her in uh, um, Florida water mm -hmm. and a couple other things. Um, when, when I got the, the one that I got, um, the guy at the Botanica did a, a little ritual uh, with me to basically ritually give it to me. That's cool. Mm. Uh, Not every Botanica owner will it, do that. It, re it reminded me a little bit of receiving a like, and then like, wow. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know a lot of them. Um, he, he goes, this is going to freak you out. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some, you know, like you go to like your typical uh, uh, witchy shop. They'll like sage something before giving it to you. I've seen, I've had some given to me. Well, they'll they'll burn some uh, uh, um, palo santo, you know, below it, you know, before giving it off. I feel like that's a fairly good equivalent to that. That's funny. Any other questions? All right. Well, again, thank you. Um, most of you guys know how to get a hold of me. If you don't, ask somebody or. Um, I do also have my own Instagram, uh, La Bruja de San Pancho. If you need me to spell it out, I can. Um, it's where I kind of post more of my own magic stuff and other things, a little self same with self promotion. Um, yeah, thank you guys. That was a lot.
Thank <laughs> you.